So I was sitting in my boss's office in 2006 at a major publishing company. Not everybody could see it yet, but the internet was about to hit us in a big way. It was beginning to look a bit bleak. The digital bridges had started burning just as I'd found myself in the industry. Not only might print be over, but publishing might be made redundant as well. So we were sitting there and we were thinking, what are we going to do when all of this hits? What's going to happen to us? We were getting a bit worried because the internet had already disrupted newspapers and music, and we were next. We were trying to work out which parts of a publishing house would survive in a digital age. How could publishers stay alive? Which parts would remain despite constant change? And one of the things we came up with was curation. Could curation be the future and be the essence of publishing? Well, it sounded right. It sounded positive and important. It sounded good for the creative industries. We liked it, but we didn't really know what it meant. If curation was the future of publishing, we didn't really know what that future looked like. So I started thinking about curation. And in the meantime, it became one of those ubiquitous, vaguely annoying buzzwords that is always trotted out in every discussion about digital media and the future of culture and all of that. And my reaction was always the same as in the office. Fine, but what does it actually mean? So I started thinking, and several things seemed to become clear. Firstly, in order to curate, you need stuff to curate. You need to first create, then to curate, right? Well, I actually started to think that maybe even that wasn't quite so obvious either. We think we know creativity when we see it in a great piece of art, in an original music composition, or in a gripping story, all preferably by a sort of bohemian character in a Parisian attic. But actually, philosophers have debated creativity for years. What is it? Where does it come from? Creativity isn't so simple. Creativity isn't just about originality. It's about accretion and combination, not just divine insight. Think about those great Thomas Edison quotes about how genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration, or about how we often miss opportunity because it comes in overalls and is called work. Think about that classic artist, Beethoven. His symphonies didn't just come to him in a flash, but he worked on them painstakingly over years and years and built on the work of composers before him. We also think too narrowly about creativity. Designing a tool, making dinner, bringing people together, building a business. All these require creativity. It's time, I think, that in the digital age, we recognize the multidimensional nature of creativity. We recognize its reality, not its ideal. Creativity isn't just the romantic artist in their garret. It's you and I experimenting in the garden, writing tweets, uh, or beating the traffic on the way home, or indeed to TEDx. Actually, curation isn't just an afterthought to creativity. Curation is creative. It's part of creativity. So I think, yes, we recognize creativity when we see it. We just don't always see it. This whole idea of creativity and curation really started in the art world. Being a painter in the mid-19th century was a bit like being a publisher today. Technology was about to make your life more difficult, and more interesting. With the invention of photography, art lost its representative role. Photos did that better than paintings. So then we had the Impressionists, and then we had waves of avant-garde uh, artists who called into question everything about art. In the space of 100 years, we went from this, which is stylized, yes, but is still basically representative, to this impressionistic image, to this which completely calls into question everything about art and creativity itself. The point is that art went from representing things to being about ideas. It was about the ideas behind the art as much as anything else. It was about the concepts. And it was around the time that art became conceptual 
probably peaking around the 1960s, that the figure of the curator really becomes central in the art world. Take Harald Seaman as a good example. He saw exhibitions as a work of art in their own right. The exhibition was a canvas, works of art, a kind of paint. And by now, curators are the key power brokers in a jet-setting art world of biennales and big money auctions. Take the Lyon Biennale of 2007 as an example. Here, two major curators worked with a group of curators who then worked with artists. So you had the bizarre situation of curators curating, curators curating artists. Creativity twice removed. Big collectors like Charles Saatchi or curators like Hansel Rakobrist are now more famous than the artists they work with. And that's just the art world for you. Creativity in art has become a kind of second-order creativity. Blockbuster exhibitions, endless theoretical discussion, um, self-referential art. All of it means that the dominant mode of modern art is curation. In effect, modern art broke the old creativity. Now, this whole idea has scaled up and gone mainstream on the web. We have serious data overload. We're fast rushing towards the zettabyte age. That's a staggering amount of data. <coughs> if a byte represents the basic unit of data, say an alphabet character, then a zettabyte is one followed by 21 zeros of bytes, a sextillion bytes, a billion terabytes. It's no wonder that curation has become such a buzzword on the internet. What are we going to do with all of that data? If digital curation has a different driver to the art world, quantity rather than aesthetics, the result is the same, curation at the forefront. Take superstar web curators like Maria Popova. Her website, Brain Pickings, is built around curation, and it draws huge audiences and makes money. Think of the big media players like HuffPo or Gorka Media. They're linkers and filterers, as much as they are producers of original content. From BuzzFeed to Boing Boing, Kotke to Kevin Kelly, Arts and Letters Daily to Ars Technica, curation plays a big role in the websites that we all look at. Digital curation is also a technical challenge. Serious venture capital investment is piling in, and the big tech, big tech firms are circling. Twitter just bought Summify, and Yahoo bought Sumly, two curation services. Services like Paper.ly and Storify are growing by the day. Perhaps in this context, the, Tumblr, the Yahoo acquisition of Tumblr really starts to make sense. At root, Tumblr is a curation service, one with over 15 billion page views a month. Twitter is a curation engine as much as it is a communications platform, and that has over half a billion users every day. Wherever you look on the web, it's really structured around curation. If you think from Twitter to Facebook, RSS to Google+, the mechanisms of interacting on the web are, are bas basically curation. We curate our news and our Amazon wish lists. We curate our photos and our business contacts. We curate our identities and our entertainment. We just have this huge, enormous pile of data over here, and then we've got human beings. And curation is the necessary interface between them. Second-order creativity, the proliferation of curation, if you like, is a basic part of living in the network world. If you want to be on the web, you have to be a curator. If you want to be a web service, you have to empower others to curate. So, that flood of data is only going to get bigger, which means that as we head towards the zettabyte age, we're heading towards the curation age. But actually, this isn't just happening in art galleries and on the web. It's happening everywhere. In the globalized and data-rich world, curation saturates our lives. Think of DJs. When did the DJ become more famous than the original artist? After all, a DJ is just a music curator. Why are so many celebrities, from Leonardo DiCaprio to David Bowie, becoming curators? Barely a week goes by without a new announcement of a celebrity curating an art show, a music festival, a run of films, 
or even a shopping mall opening. And in fact, the example of a shopping mall shows just how deep this goes. Think about a shopping mall. It's a blend of shops, styles, and experiences. It's a heavily curated space, but it also allows us to curate ourselves. It is enabling us to make choices. Think of all those choices at the food court, from Meze to Mexican, and we're drowning in so many choices that we're forced to curate as a result. Curation isn't just about this. It's also about this. We curate our wardrobes, our appearances, and our diets. We curate our experiences. What about designer holidays? Consumerism is nothing if not the mass adoption of curation. We even curate our economies. Look at the financial markets, hedge funds, portfolios of investments. The economy is half run by people who care about juxtaposition. Balance, future value, and a good narrative. The economy is run by money curators, but we just call them hedge fund managers. Like art curators, they're just looking to pick and arrange complementary products to achieve goals. They're not actually producing anything; they're just putting stuff together. DJs, gallery curators, fund managers—they're all doing broadly similar roles, but in very different contexts. And tellingly. They all came to prominence around the same time in the late 20th century, and they tend to cluster in the same sort of places. Like the art world, our consumer lives, our economy has gone abstract, conceptual, second order. We have more complexity and more information in every area of our lives. And also, as automation starts taking over more and more of the basic tasks. We need to find ways to keep creating the jobs that add value. Second-order roles, curatorial roles—they fit the bill. These are the jobs that will, we will keep creating and we will keep adding. So yes, we need more DJs. Broadly, then, I think all of this should be welcomed. We now, you know, creativity used to be the preserve of a few inventors, artists, and oddballs, but now it's everywhere. We have more agency. More creative potential in every single area of our lives. We have choices as never before. Returning to the example of the creative industries, we're no longer confined to a broadcast model where you, the audience, will watch this and at this time. Now we pick and choose. We save for later. We watch all at once on our laptops, our phones, our tablets, occasionally the TV. The point is, we curate our viewing. Not the network suits. That may seem like a small shift, but because it's happening in so many different ways, this explosion of choice and, as a result, curation is changing the way we experience life. But there may also be a few problems with this. Curation isn't just a sort of force of you know goodness out there. Let's take sort of some web services. Take Google. We aren't just users of Google's product; we are Google's product. They sell advertising to businesses. They curate businesses for they create audiences for businesses, and we are that audience. Choice, second-order creativity, curation. These come with costs. Think about how much control we have over the contemporary art market, or. Even more importantly, how much control do we have over the financial markets? Exactly. And let's imagine for a minute that things keep on going as they are, and we keep curating all of the time, and we just curate more and more. What then? What happens to first-order creativity? Could we be seeing the death of first-order creativity? The author and computer scientist Jaron Lanier thinks that the web is just recycling itself. All of our web culture is. Playing on the same old memes that all riff off the same old 25-year-old geek culture. We have an art world hung up on vapid experiments and brand names. We have an economy that cares more about shuffling bundles of share options than building businesses. We have more chance to mould our lives, but less chance of making something completely new. So when we were sitting in that office. Uh, thinking about 
the future of publishing and what we were going to do, I guess we thought that curation was a simple answer. It's not. Curation is bigger, more complex, and more widespread than I think we'd ever imagined. If we think curation is just about stuffy publishers and elite art galleries, we're wrong. It's not. If we think curation is just another pointless, faddish buzzword used by media types in trendy cafes, we're wrong. It's not. Curation is about seeing creativity in a different way. It's about why the web is the way it is. It's about where all our lives are heading, and we shouldn't forget that. So I say, get curating. Be creative. This is about choice. It's about empowerment. It's about making the absolute most that our era has to offer. But remember, we aren't just curators. We are curated. Thank you.